Okay, good afternoon everybody and welcome to today's retail webinar. Um, thank you for joining us. We've got three presenters today. Uh, David McCorkadale, who heads up uh, retail for KPMG in the UK. We've got Paul Martin, who's the MD of Strategy and Insights at KPMG Boxwood. And myself, who's Customer Experience Director for KPMG Numwood. Okay. So what we're going to take you through today, you can see on the next slide, we are going to introduce you to the Customer Experience Excellence Center, for those who have not seen it before. Uh, David's going to take us through some sector challenges, going through the current state of the nation and the, the challenges UK retail is currently facing. Paul's then going to um, look at some operational challenges and the, the value, convenience and experience equation. And then I'm going to take you through some US best practice and I'm going to take you through some some emerging trends which we think potentially hold the key for uh, creating customer experience differentiation in your in your organizations. So before we move on, you'll see on your screen a blue box which allows you to ask questions um, any time throughout the, the session. We'll take as many questions as we can at the end. So if you want to ask questions during the, the course of the next hour, please type them in and we'll um, we'll we'll take them in turn towards the end of the session. Just before we get started, uh, we like to do a, a poll on these webinars uh, to ask a, a, a pertinent question of, of the listeners. So could we ask, um, I ask you to give us an answer on this following question and we'll, we'll publish the results towards the end of the session. So in the organizations you represent, does the senior leadership team see their, their income, their bonuses reduced if key customer targets aren't met. So if have a think about that, um, use the voting buttons to tell us what the case is for your organization, and towards the end of the session we'll, we'll publish the answer. Okay, so straight on, first of all, to a quick overview of the Customer Experience Excellence Center. This is something um, KPMG and them would have been running for seven years now. Um, we go to various international markets, so the UK, the US, and, uh, and, and Australia. And in each of those marketplaces, we speak to between seven and 10,000 consumers about the everyday experiences they have with customer-facing organizations. Over the seven years, we've got well over a million customer evaluations, and we've now got a view on almost 1,000 brands from 10 industry sectors around the world. I think what's most important is that not only do we ask uh, customers what they think of a brand and ask them to rate brands, we ask them to explain when things go well or things go badly. And over the course of seven years, we've got tens of thousands of customer narratives that give us a very, very clear view as to who experienced leaders are all around the world. That view of what experienced leaders are delivering led us to create the six-pillar model. So you'll see on screen now um, our six-pillar model. Uh, this states that a great customer experience um, can be described by um, any one of these six pillars. So the pillars are personalization, expectations, time and effort, integrity, resolution, and empathy. And these are the headings that customers describe either great or, or poor customer experiences underneath. They also help organizations identify where they stand versus their competitors, so they act as a great benchmark to understand where you have opportunities to, to improve customer experiences. They also help us understand how your customers are experiencing um, other brands in other industries that we see are starting to impact what they expect from your organization and from the industry um, that your organization competes within. So we're often asked, why be an experienced leader? Well, based on our data set, um, each of these pillars is very, very important in delivering a great customer experience, and the leaders tend to do a great job in all pillars. Um, what we did was analyze the impact each of these pillars has on, on desirable customer behaviors. So you can see um, what a business most wants out of its customers is loyalty, which you can see on the right-hand side, and advocacy, which you can see on the left-hand side. And whilst we can see personalization in both instances drives uh, the greatest impact on those outcomes, uh, we can see actually that uh, each of the pillars is in itself very important. 
it's important to say at this point that you can't just decide to get behind two or three pillars. Um, leading organizations do a great job of each pillar. Okay, so we know that each pillar is important in driving those, those desirable customer outcomes. And of course, um, from an organization point of view, we're seeking to drive shareholder value. And what you can see on this chart is a series of first order results, i.e. if you get customer experience right by delivering against those six pillars, you'll benefit from repurchase loyalty, you'll benefit from cross sales, your customers will be less sensitive to price, and you'll benefit from word of mouth. That then leads, leads to the six second order results you can see on the chart. I won't go through them in detail. And then those in turn drive um, all of those four uh, drivers of shareholder value. So customer experience is very, very uh, important in driving ultimately shareholder value via those first order and second order results. Okay, so having established um, a model for understanding customer experience and understanding the importance of customer experience, it's clear here in the UK, uh, and globally in fact, we've got some big challenges to overcome. So I'm going to hand over now to Dave McCorkadale, who's going to take us through some of those sector challenges that our UK retailers are now facing up to. Thank you, Craig. Retail across the world remains a challenged and a challenging sector since the financial crisis back in 2008. And what this chart looks at first is GDP growth and retail growth shown for 2015 to 2020. Uh, from that, you can see that um, you know, US and North American GDP growth is, is still relatively low at 1.9%. But consumer spend is actually recovering, and, and retail sales growth is forecast to be 4.3%. On the other side of the chart, Asia um, is where the, the, the global growth is. It's much higher. It's actually lower than it was before, but many other territories are very envious of that rate of growth that uh, the Asian market uh, is enjoying. The story in the middle is that Europe still has it tough. Uh, it's a territory of the lowest growth, both at uh, GDP and really almost at retail. Uh, and retailers don't have a huge amount of growth to go after in, in the European market. Therefore, they've got to look to expand into new territories um, in order to try and find seams of growth. Uh, and we argue that uh, you know, UK retailers are particularly well positioned to do so because we've got a, a first-class e-com capability uh, to take on new online growth and, and seek those new markets. But if we look at some of the key factors impacting global the global economy today, you know, China is continuing to decelerate. Uh, it's predicted at 6.8% growth. I, I, I still think that's uh, a, a terrific amount of growth for, for people to get into, but it's, uh, it's a difficult territory to break into. We've got recessions still continuing throughout Brazil, Russia. And the Eurozone debt crisis for the last few years has had an impact, but, but you know, the Brexit vote that we've had last week is likely to have uh, greater repercussions and, and may drive an entire change to that whole landscape. But also today we've got geopolitical factors impacting us. Uh, oil prices are predicted to remain low for some time to come. Uh, the situation in Syria and the Middle East uh, draws in many superpowers with, with uh, big weaponry, and that's led to mass migration, which is uh, causing challenges politically across the world. Also looking uh, west of us, the U.S. presidential race uh, is certainly a, a, a two-horse race now, but it's very uncertain as to who might win that and, and what the implications for the global economy might be from that. What I then look at is what are the key, impacts, uh, key factors impacting the U.K. economy today. Well, most of the FTSE 100 leaders uh, felt leaving the UK is going to damage the medium-term outlook um, for, for the UK economy. But today in the retail sector, what's most concerning from the Brexit vote uh, in the immediacy is what are the currencies doing? The currencies are being very volatile and people are sitting back in the hedging they do or don't have. Um, but, but what's going to happen in the short term to consumer confidence because that's what drives retail sales. In the longer term, we've still got an awful lot of politics to go on through this, but uh, people will be anxious to look at what happens to pricing, to margins, and, and to trade agreements uh, that, that uh, will be negotiated over the next two to three years. 
We've been expecting a rise in interest rates to come. Uh, in fact, in the short term, they're being cut again uh, due to the Brexit vote. Um, but the U.S. is beginning to move to a, a, a sort of more normal monetary policy that is driving a, a, an increase in interest rates. Um, but a number of uh, currencies and key export markets for us have lost significant value in, in, in years. So the currency changes are the thing that I think is most important for us in the retail sector. We've also had for a while now lower commodity prices. Uh, at the oil level, that's great news for consumers. We don't spend so much on petrol and heating, so it should put more into our coffers. Um, but the large oil companies are, are you know, struggling with their own cash flows, and that's got implications. But other commodity prices are low, and that's driving price deflation across uh, the, the, the retail landscape. From a UK point of view, looking at GDP growth, uh, it's, it's eased again this year. Um, inflation has fluctuated between plus and minus 0.1%, and is forecast to, to increase only to 1% for this year. What we see, though, is the, the biggest challenge I think the retail sector has is that the, the GDP growth in, uh, in, across the UK has grown by about 2.5%, 3%, uh, but retail has failed uh, to maintain its share of that, uh, mainly because consumers of other uh, areas to, to focus their spending on. They like experience, they like travel, they like leisure. And, and retail, whilst it's a, a very challenging market, uh, amongst itself, we've also got challenges with other demands on the consumer wallet. And, and that's where I think the retail sector has to fight for and, and drive customer experience with. So if we look at what's holding growth back, certainly you know, consumer psychology and behavior is very different. Um, you know, consumers are no longer buying just as they like because they want to. They're buying when they need something, and, and that's quite a change from the sort of consumerist background we had in the early 2000s. Um, and, and that's a, a behavior pattern that's here to stay. It, it might be a millennial thing, but it's, uh, it, it's certainly also being uh, um, exercised by the, by the baby boomers. As I mentioned, there are many competing activities for that share of wallet, be that leisure, experience, travel, uh, that the retail sector has to work very hard to drive um, consumers to spend within the retail sector uh, rather than other sectors to keep that share of wallet. There's four other matters I think are very much connected. You know, price deflation, which has been driven by transparency of pricing through the internet and price comparative websites, coupled with overcapacity in the market. Consumers have plenty of choice today. And the culture we've got of discounting and pricing, the consumers are waiting um, for, for a, a decent bargain before they, they open their wallet. Those are all related and are you know, more medium-term uh, drivers that are holding growth back that the, consumer, that the retailers have to work their way around. Uh, we've got the weather. We don't know what is a normalized pattern. We don't know if we have the snow now in winter and sun in the summer. It's, it's very different, but, but for the last four or five years, it's been different, uh, and, and the fashion world can't constantly blame the weather for, for lack of sales. So when I look at this overcapacity and price deflation and discounting, um, and, and the Internet having put the consumer so much in control today, it's very obvious that customer experience must be top of the agenda for, for the retail sector. Customers have a choice. Uh, loyalty should not be taken for granted. And so it's important that customer experience itself uh, unlocks that greater share of wallet. Coupled with factors that are holding back growth, th there's many factors also impacting cost to operate for the retail sector. You know, we now live in an omni-channel world. That's a very expensive uh, service to deliver. Um, we've also had, in this sector, imposed upon us uh, uh, increased cost base to the national living wage, the apprenticeship levy. Uh, we've still got high business rates. Uh, and the cost to go and seek new markets in the international world um, it can be very prohibitive. So with a, a significantly increasing cost base and a top line that, that is uh, not got a lot of growth to go for, it, it's, it's, it's clear that retailers have a, a, a very big squeeze on their margins, and that's driving a focus on productivity. But it also, when you drive a focus on productivity, need to take into account what the uh, customer is wanting. 
So it's the customer and the customer experience that we want to focus on today. And I'm now going to pass across to my colleague, Paul Martin, who's going to look at what retailers are actually doing to address their operating model to change, uh, to attract and, and, and work at customer experience. Thank you very much, David. You very rightly uh, focused uh, or introduced all of the macro and the microeconomic disruption we're experiencing uh, across the UK and the globe at the moment. Uh, I want to build on that and really look at the disruption we are seeing, which is basically being, uh, being driven by the consumer. We quite recently undertook a significant piece of research, and many of you will be very familiar with uh, the 620 different shop emissions, the 1,223 different moments of truth. We have built a very significant market research industry that uh, has analyzed the consumer to death, I would argue. We have actually taken a step back we have looked at what we believe are the three key consumer drivers that really determine uh, the shop emission today. Let me just briefly introduce these three. The first is value. Value is all about the right price, but it can also mean the uh, value for money. So it is not always just about the lowest price. The second consumer driver is all about convenience. Convenience could mean your proximity retailer at the end of your street. It could also mean a click and collect offering. It could also mean home delivery. Convenience uh, means many different things for different people. And then finally, experience, all about retail theater, bringing enjoyment to your shopping trip. And we believe these three key drivers actually explain 98% of all shopping missions. Now, when we looked a little deeper into this subject matter, uh, we found a whole host of organizations that have actually been founded in the last couple of years, the last five years, who have embraced one or more of these key drivers uh, and are disrupting many of the traditional players. And I would ask every organization to have a look at their core proposition and if they are good at at least one of these key drivers. Now, we have undertaken this exercise with a number uh, of retailers in the UK, but also uh, across many other territories. And we have found out that a number of organizations are actually not good at any uh, of these drivers. And that does generally lead to the question, well, if you're not meeting 98% of all customers' demands, uh, you will definitely have a struggle uh, in the future going forward. Now, just to pick on one or two examples in this context, organizations such as Warby Parker, a North American eyewear retailer, who have completely disrupted the eyewear market by introducing a single price point private label glass frame offering uh, and have also built uh, a real significant customer experience into their stores. Their stores uh, are built like libraries. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the uh, moments where you would use uh, glasses the most when reading, they have really embraced the driver of value, the single price point, and the uh, driver of experience, the in-store experience, to fundamentally disrupt uh, this sector. Uh, therefore, in this context, I can really only ask organizations to look at these three drivers and to ensure that you're good at at least one of these. That really takes me to the next uh, slide, uh, which is all about digital growth. Um, a couple of years ago, a number of analysts would have argued that the store is dead. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that that is absolutely not the right answer. The store still has a pivotal component to play in the retail ecosystem, but digital is here to stay. And when I say digital, I don't just mean e-commerce. I mean digital activation in store. I do mean e-commerce, m-commerce, social commerce, 
So all of these different components need to be considered uh, in your retail ecosystem going forward. And the slide you can see on your screen really describes that in today's world, you need to have one operating model, one way you structure your business to deliver multiple business models. That is becoming more and more important. We see for many organizations in many countries, there is still a significant amount of runway for the physical concept, uh, but at the same time, you need to be delivering your digital proposition and you need to connect these propositions in one symbiotic approach. It is not good enough today to have parallel universes living next to each other. Some people call this omnichannel. I much prefer calling this customer-centric channel agnostic. That will become more and more important going forward. And that leads me to the next slide where you can see uh, the outline uh, of an operating model, all of the different elements uh, you need to consider uh, to deliver your value proposition. What you cannot see on this slide, though, is the absolute fundamental link between the operating model, the uh, business model, and the customer experience journey. And experience is a really key word in this context. More and more organizations will need to deliver that fantastic element of experience to drive their value proposition in the eyes of the consumer. And I'm going to hand over to Craig, who is going to highlight uh, some of these organizations that are best practice in delivering great experience. Okay, thanks, Paul. Thanks, David. So we've established that UK retail has a, a tough backdrop to cope with, um, but that customer experience appears to be an area where future growth can be driven um, if we can get it right. So let's take a look at the US now and see if there's any clues from what's happening over there as to how we can be inspired by, by the way they're going about this. So first of all, why look at the US anyway? So back at the turn of the century in 2000, it was pretty much accepted that UK retail was 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 the best in the world. It was um, it was seen to be cutting edge. Somehow that's turned around over the last 10 to 15 years, and we can actually see from this chart um, that um, for most industries, um, but in particular for grocery retail, um, the US uh, delivers experience ahead of the rest, uh, ahead of the UK. So we can see in that top bar that the grocery retail has a 5% lead in terms of the customer experience uh, customers record. And for non-grocery retail, the lead is small. It's 1%, but nonetheless, it's still ahead of the UK. Let's take a look at the brands that are doing uh, great customer experience things then in, in the US market. So what this chart shows is um, 245 U.S. brands rated best on the left to, to worst on the right. Um, we've highlighted all of the grocers, in this case, uh, who are in the top 100. Um, and we can see there's a lot of them. And uh, even more uh, pertinently, most of them tend to be on the left-hand side of the chart. So, so in the top 10, top 20, top 30. If you look at the shape of the chart, you can see on the far left that there's a, there's a group of 11 or 12 brands who are starting to pull away from the pack. Um, and within that group of um, 11 or 12 uh, really superbly performing brands, we can see three uh, U.S. Uh, grocers. First of all, Publix, HEB in seventh place, and Wegmans in eighth place. Pushing our view out to the top 30, uh, other brands come into play. Trader Joe's at 20. Uh, Aldi at 21, Kroger at 14, and Hy-Vee at 28. So some big names there. And what's interesting about those brands is they all tend to do very different things for the customer, but whatever they're doing, it's getting them towards the top of the customer experience ranking. This next chart then looks at non-grocery retailers. Um, and again, we've got that same um, number one to number 245 uh, across the whole uh, U.S. consumer landscape. And again, we can see an awful lot of uh, retailers in that top 100. We've got Amazon in fourth place. We've got Costco in sixth, Zappos in tenth, 
and Nordstrom in 16th. So again, some big brands, all with very, very different propositions for the customer, but they found a way to make those propositions and, and um, uh, experiences um, really strike a note with their customer base. So first of all, we're going to look at three of those brands we've talked about and find out specifically what they're doing. Uh, just last week at the U.S. Food Marketing uh, Industry Conference in Los Angeles, um, Craig Boyan, the chief uh, customer, the chief operating officer for HEB, drew attention to the common ground that some of those big brands have in how they're structuring their organizations. Now, whilst they all do very different things, Craig pointed out that these brands all did or were very, very early to recognize the importance uh, that their people played in, in driving great customer experience. That's the theme we're going to pick up later. But for the next five minutes, let's look at some of those brands and understand how the six pillars helps us to identify and explain how these organizations are getting ahead. So the first brand we're going to look at is Publix. Um, Publix do a brilliant job of exceeding customer expectations in, in the grocery marketplace. They were ranked third um, in our U.S. survey, um, and what we particularly notice about Publix is the experience, the the relationship they have with their motive, with their workforce. They've got an uncommonly loyal workforce for the retail industry. Over 20% of their employees have 10 years service or more. Um, the workforce is extremely motivated, and the way they treat their people is generally seen as the bedrock of the great experience they deliver. So everybody in the organization who works 1,000 hours a year attracts an 8.5% uh, salary bonus in, in stocks. Now, it's a privately held company, so this, th th these stocks are held and a nominal stock price is set every year. But over the course of a 10, 15 year career, that 8.5% salary each year can grow to be a very, very nice um, uh, bonus for working for the company. They promote from within almost exclusively. Their, their view of the world is that there is a public's way of doing things and a public's way of delivering customer service and experience. And they would much rather hire the right people in the first place and then promote from within. An advancement is extremely transparent. So in every store, in every, um, in every uh, staff restaurant, there are uh, charts up showing exactly what you need to do to get to the next level. Um, and therefore, everybody in the business knows exactly their path uh, to the top should they wish to pursue it. We talked earlier about their excellence in delivering against customer expectations. And their internal mantra when they um, build stores in new locations is to overwhelm the customers with customer service. They make certain that anybody in that catchment area who values customer service and is willing to pay for it um, will come to Publix. Um, and then once they get those customers on board as, as, as loyal shoppers, they then focus on capturing more of that segment's wallet. So they don't get pulled into opening price point promotions. They don't get pulled into, into launching value ranges that perhaps don't fit well with their organizational ethos. Their entire focus is get customers through the door and then deliver a level of service that people who can afford to pay for it uh, do go on and pay for it. Our second brand is HEB. Um, so they do a great job in the personalization pillar. Um, HEB is a, a San Antonio-based organization with 350 stores now. The vast majority are in Texas, but they've actually gone over the border into Mexico. They play their Texan heritage very, very strongly. So Texans have a, a very strong sense of, of, of the importance of the state. Um, so their, their sub-brands draw on Texan heritage. Um, the state flag plays a big part in, in the uh, store environment. And the, they chose local supplies wherever possible, and that fact is, is, is heavily, heavily promoted. All of that plays into this Texan pride that, that is very obvious if you talk to Texans. They also do a great job of making a virtue of their fresh credentials. So uh, they have sushi and guacamole production stations right in the center of each department. Um, so you can say exactly what's been produced. You can see exactly how fresh the product is. It's produced in front of your in front of your eyes, um, and of course that's got a very positive spin off across the rest of the store. And they are known quite rightly for their fresh credentials. 
they're also brilliant at sampling. So many UK retailers um, uh, do sampling in store, um, but HEB have really raised it to an art form. So whereas traditionally in the UK, sampling is often seen as a revenue stream, HEB see it as absolutely core to the customer experience. So whenever the stores open, there are, there are multiple enthusiastic sampling colleagues around the store, um, and this is seen as a key differentiator amongst their customer base. Finally, in terms of driving that personalization pillar, what HEB do a great job of is, is really meeting the needs of, of the micro markets in which they operate. So stores in Hispanic areas uh, feature predominantly um, Hispanic ranges and Spanish signage uh, as, as opposed to English. Similarly, in their upscale um, uh, catchments, they have a format called Central Markets, who do a fantastic job of delivering range and product to meet the needs of time poor and, and cash rich customers who make up the majority of their customer base in those areas. The third brand we're looking at is Costco, which of course will be well known to many um, many of uh, people tuning into the webinar today. Um, Costco do a great job of trust and integrity amongst their customer base. So they've got a very, very transparent business model. So the business model, which is well known, is broadly that your membership fee, which for most people is around a dollar a week, um, effectively drives the profit line and their merchandise is marked up at 15% to cover operating costs. What that means for the customer is a fantastic deal um, because, of course, in many categories, many retailers make an awful lot more than 15% margin. So this is, to an extent, true delivery of everyday low price, which, if you can get it right, customers love, and it, uh, again, drives that trust, drives that belief in the integrity of the brand. In the US, for customers, the membership structures are win-win. So if you select the higher cost platinum package, which is around $2, $2.50 a week, effectively, if that doesn't pay for you in spend-linked loyalty rebates, then the customer will write you a check at the end of the year to make sure you're no worse off having chosen that package. So again, that really drives a view that the organization is very trustworthy and it's doing things that are right for the customer and not necessarily right for the brand. To pick up on the colleague um, connection again, Costco's a great place to work. So they pay um, a good level of pay uh, compared to the competitor set they uh, compete with. Um, but more to the point, they have a very uh, contained set of opening hours. So whereas an awful lot of American retail tend to uh, be open every day of the year, um, Costco make a thing of not opening on national holidays which is a huge attraction for retail workers who want to be with their families um, across the, the 15 national holidays in the US. So we've seen there some examples of um, customer experience delivered by some high-performing customer brands. But, you know, frankly, a lot of the things we've talked about there have been tried in the UK and Europe and haven't necessarily driven the results that some of our US uh, counterparts are seeing. So is there something we can learn from the U.S. that is perhaps more fundamental than just um, customer-facing uh, changes in the way we do things? And we think there is. So in this year's U.S. report, we've seen five key trends, key themes that are starting to emerge from the U.S. that we think are potential um, fundamental drivers of customer experience and how they're delivered. So we'll go through each of these five themes. Um, you can see the themes on the slide as we speak. Um, the themes are the sum of many small things, um, innovation on the omnichannel experience, which, uh, which, which Paul picked upon earlier, the connecting power of customer purpose, something we're calling the human equity continuum, and finally, organizing the business around customer journeys. So we're going to take each of those um, one at a time now. So the first thing we talk about is the uh, customer experience being the sum of many small things. So you may remember on the back of the UK um, cycling team's success um, in the past five to ten years, Dave Brailsford has talked a lot about marginal gains, about his view that tiny little improvements across everything the team did were the key to um, creating a great team from a good team. 
In the customer experience world, we know these micro experiences are very, very powerful, but the art really is knowing where and when to deliver them. So if you can somehow prioritize influential experiences, you can drive a return on investment and make sure the customer is receiving an experience that has the power to drive loyalty and to drive experience. So to do this, we need to understand the customer journey. And this customer journey has to be understood from the outside in. So the view of the customer journey has to be shaped by customers as opposed to internal technicians who undoubtedly know an awful lot about their subject matter, but perhaps are a little remote from what real customers think. Once those priority experiences have been identified and we've spoken to real customers to get a view of what they actually want, we need to create what we call signature actions. So signature actions are actions that are unique to a brand and that have the power to maximize positive emotional impact and therefore become associated with the organization who the customer is interacting with. In the hotel industry, a great example of a, 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 a signature action is, is Doubletree's warm cookie on arrival. So that's actually a relatively low cost um, uh, item to deliver. Um, but over, um, over, uh, over multiple uh, interactions with the brand, it becomes associated with the brand. Consumers talk about it a lot, and it has the power to bring people back. It's something to look forward to um, as you check into a hotel, whether you're away on business or leisure. Um, it, it goes down very, very well with the customer base. So customer experience is no longer about one big action, um, it's about lining up a series of small actions, some of which are hygiene factors, but some of which are signature actions that become positively associated with your brand. Okay, our second of the five themes is uh, innovation and, and the omnichannel experience. So increasingly, the word omnichannel is starting to have negative connotations. To customers, it's just buying stuff. They don't see channels. They see a brand from whom they want to buy something, and they want every possible channel to work in their favor to create a more convenient, a higher value um, uh, customer experience. When brands get digital innovation right, um, customers talk about it very, very enthusiastically, and we see it driving their views as, as to what a brand can be. They tend to become super fans as opposed to just people who use the organization. So Steve Case, who founded AOL and now runs a, a business investing in new tech, identifies that we're about to see a new wave of innovation, which requires a totally different mindset. So where, whereas wave one was about technicians developing for early adopters, and wave two is about technicians trying to do what they thought was best for the customer, we see wave three as being about the seamless integration of channels um, into customers' day-to-day -day lives. And that's got to be customer driven. As we said earlier, customers, drop a re uh, customers shop a retail brand. They don't shop a channel. So again, the outside in view of what the customer's looking for, how customers live their day-to-day -day lives is key to delivering uh, fantastic, excellent uh, experience innovation in the digital and omnichannel field, which again has the power to drive loyalty and drive advocacy. So Kroger, another of those um, top 10 American brands we talked about earlier, do a fantastic job in, in driving digital experience. They're running a trial at the moment, which they're calling Digital Shelf, which has um, totally reinvented what um, digital tech in store can do. So five, 10 years ago, um, Europe uh, and the US, in fact, was, was trialing electronic shelf edge labeling. But the driver of that really was cost reduction. The driver was taking all of the hard work away from changing labeling. Um, and nobody really thought about the customer in that process. The shelf edge in those trials was very, very dull. It was harder to read. You couldn't tell where the offers were. Customers didn't like it, even though it delivered for the organizations that were trialing it. What Kroger have done, again, is talk to customers and found out what they really want from the shopping trip. And by linking the customer's shopping list to their mobile phone app, the strip can become a, a partner in their shopping experience. 
it can, for example, remind you when you miss a product. So it knows which store you're shopping in, it knows what you want to buy, and it knows where their products are located. And if you walk past the end of an aisle with a product in, your mobile phone can tell you, actually, you need to go back a step. And actually, as you walk down the aisle, the product you wanted will can flash and tell you exactly where it is on the shelf. Customers can interact with it as much as they want. So if you're doing a normal shop without the mobile app, it doesn't matter. It's just like shopping in a normal store. But if you want to interact with it, it can show you recipe products. At the touch of a button, you can understand exactly what's in the product. You can stand in front of a range and ask it to flash all of the products that are gluten-free, for example. So for us, this is a great piece of digital innovation that is working um, for the customer, and it's driven by what the customer really needs as opposed to what the technician believes the customer needs. Our third and fourth themes are connected, and they are around the customer. We talked earlier around um, the importance of uh, how colleagues can help an organization deliver uh, customer experience excellence. Um, and we're seeing increasingly in the States the power of a connected customer purpose. Um, so Simon Sinek, in his Start With Why book, which was very influential five, six, seven years ago, he suggested that employees and consumers are happier working for an organization that, have a, uh, that has a very clear view of why it does what it does. And what we now see is where employees and where customers see a connecting purpose, so where they both understand what they, what they get from an organization, that is very, very powerful in the delivery of customer experience. So, um, again, another top 10 brand is Wegmans in the U.S., which is a, a Connecticut-based grocer. Um, they do a fantastic job of putting the customer first. Um, and the connecting purpose there is that both customers and colleagues know that whenever they're in a Wegmans store, truly putting the customer first is what they're going to experience and what they're going to have to deliver. So, again, wherever an employee um, has to decide what to do next um, on the shop floor, he knows his job first and foremost is putting the customer first. That manifests itself in excellent customer experience and happy employees. They know exactly why they're in the store. They know exactly why they're employed. That takes us to the fourth theme we've seen, which is um, what we're calling the human equity continuum. So over the past 10, 15 years, many organizations have put in place some very, very good um, uh, cultural um, transformation programs. Um, they've put in place uh, colleague behaviors and what colleagues are expected to, to do in their everyday role. And they've put a whole range of customer uh, steering groups into position and, and customer transformation programs. And many of those have worked well. When all of those things align, so when the company culture um, shapes uh, the colleague behaviors and that in itself shapes the experiences colleagues have while working for the business, we know that uh, we can get a very powerful exponential effect as each of the engines driving those individual uh, transformation points are working in concert as opposed to working against each other. What the equity continuum basically says is if the customer, if the company culture delivers great colleague experiences in the workplace, then that in itself will shape how colleagues behave when they're talking to customers, when they're dealing with customers. That will itself create um, positive customer experiences. If those positive experiences are delivered in the right places, we know customers will behave in the way we want them to, i.e. buy more stuff and advocate the brand. And that drives the business outcomes we're looking for, which is sustained profitability and, and growth. Okay, so the fifth of our um, themes that we've seen in the States is organizing for customer journeys. So this is potentially the most cutting edge and potentially the most difficult to launch, particularly for uh, medium-sized and large companies where they are very traditionally organized. Many organizations, as we know, um, organize around function or channel. So often this leads to short-term profit um, benefits as um, savings, as new ways of doing things are, are discovered and implemented. 
Um, but over time, it means that the business's core customer centricity tends to drift off track. <clears throat> In a world of social media and, and crowdsourced we reviews, we increasingly see that th your brand is actually the sum total of the customer experiences you can deliver. So whereas once the brand was what the organization told the customers it was, increasingly it's how customers described what happened to them when they interact with your organizations. And once we accept that, it makes sense to organize around the customer experience. Many organizations now are, um, use a matrix approach when it comes to um, dealing with customer issues. So most organizations have customer steering groups who bring functions together, and that has been um, successful in driving the customer agenda over the last dec or decade or so. But we're now just starting to see evidence of a few organizations organizing around the customer journey. So splitting um, the organization's customer experience into a series of customer journeys and organizing resources in a radial fashion. So at the head of each group is somebody in charge of the customer. So uh, whether it's a, a chief customer officer, whether it's a, for example, in the FS world, uh, head of mortgage, all of the sub functions organize to maximize the customer experience at those customer journey points. That means the customer is at the heart of every organizational decision. Um, which in itself drives uh, great customer centricity. A final customer, um, a, a, a final organizational approach is something called holocratic organization. Um, this is very, very out there at the moment, but a handful of, um, of, con of, of, uh, of disruptors, small to medium size, are starting to use an approach where you have a very fleet of foot group of people in the business who don't necessarily specialize in one task or one channel or one function, but they come together and change roles um, as new issues need to be dealt with, as new approaches need to be, um, need to be driven forward. So in there, we've got five themes that we think um, are potentially at the heart of um, transforming customer experience um, um, across UK, European, global retail. Having thought about all of that, three things for me stand out in conclusion. The first thing is the importance of establishing what we'd call an outside-in view of the customer, an outside-in view of the customer journey. I don't think it's any longer relevant for um, internal specialists to hold that customer journey um, analysis and mapping. It's got to start with the customer, and then we have to adapt to what the customer wants as opposed to what is most um, functionally straightforward or relevant. My second conclusion would be um, the importance of knowing which customer journey points have the capability of bringing customers back. It's very easy to throw money at the whole customer journey, at your whole proposition, and improve customer experience. That will kill the organization in the long term, it's most important to find out what really matters and create those uh, customer, those, those unique customer experience signature moments that become associated with your brand. And finally, the emerging importance of the employee in delivering customer experience. Um, it's been talked about for a long time, but I think we're now starting to see some, some big brands doing some really interesting things in improving the experience of being an employee. Um, Airbnb, for example, have a chief employee experience officer. Um, so again, the HR function isn't organized around process. It's around the needs that the chief uh, ex employee experience officer identifies. And everything they do is driven to make working there a, a great place. OK. so. Um, there are tons more resources on nunwood.com um, should you wish to look, and look at this in any more detail. Um, we asked you all a question earlier um, about whether the senior leadership team in your businesses were um, uh, incentivized on driving uh, the customer KPI. And we can see that around one in four of you said yes, um, around one in five of you said no, um, and the balance weren't sure. So. One in four organizations appear to have um, a KPI 
related to the customer driving senior leadership team bonuses. We see that as very important because it's very easy just to look at um, functional and operational KPIs. What really matters is what the customer thinks. Okay, so I think we've got about 10 minutes to handle any questions that have come in. So Paul, I think uh, you're going to take the first question. Yes, thank you very much, Craig. Uh, the, uh, a number of questions have come through, so thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, please feel free uh, to use the remaining uh, 10 minutes to ask us any first questions. Uh, the, the question uh, I'd like to uh, tackle first uh, is, these are great examples of businesses that have considered the customer experience seemingly from their inception. Uh, do we have any examples of businesses that have switched to a more customer-centric model and how they accomplished this change. Um, Craig, do you want to answer that? So in the UK um, Customer Experience Excellence um, uh, Report, we've identified for years the success of Richard Sounds. So Richard Sounds started life as a, a single store, actually, and it, 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 for, for 10 years it, it, it made its living, made its profit, selling heavily discounted end-of-line products to to um, customers who were in the know. To an extent, it was a, a brand that relatively few people knew about, but if you knew about it, you would travel miles to go there. They advertised in the specialist press, and to normal, uh, to, to everyday customers, I guess, they were just um, another Tottenham Court Road-style electronics retailer. As they got bigger and bigger, what they realized was end-of-line product would very soon not provide them with enough product to... Um, to, to be sustainable. Um, if you've got 20 stores, finding an end-of-line product in sufficient volume isn't, isn't possible. Um, so what they did was uh, fundamentally talk to customers, understand what they didn't like about the mainstream electrical retail industry, and create a new um, proposition around fixing those issues. So extremely customer-centric, um, very, very advisory in how they sell to you, Compare that now to the high street and, and still in mainstream electrical retail all around the world, um, colleagues are incentivized to sell you additional products you don't want. Um, so richer, understand what customers really want from that retail sector and, and give it superbly well. Paul, you got anything else? Yes, absolutely. I, I mean, the disruptors that I, I referenced uh, earlier on uh, I would absolutely agree. These organizations were built with the, the customer at the heart of everything they do. But we have a number of examples, and let me just highlight uh, two of the leading uh, departmental store operators here in the UK with John Lewis and House of Fraser, who have a very long-standing history, and you would argue uh, have historically been very product-centric. They have transformed themselves to be both product and customer centric uh, over uh, the last uh, couple of years. Um, we as an organization, we help businesses uh, undertake this transformation. Uh, and one of the key points I, I really can only highlight again, and Craig, you mentioned this uh, earlier on, uh, is the, the cultural transformation that businesses need to undertake to actually put the customer at uh, the center of everything they do. Uh, and these examples, and uh, Craig, you mentioned Richard Sounds, I mentioned John Lewis and House of Fraser, there are many, many organizations uh, that uh, we have seen over uh, the last 10 or 15 years that have embarked on this journey uh, to transform themselves. Uh, and we do believe that this is an absolute mission critical transformation going forward. Let me uh, pick up on a further question. Uh, a question has come through, uh, am I correct in understanding that you should not create different offers for different channels? Does this confuse the customer? Craig, have you got uh, something to add to that? Yeah, so um, time and time again, when we talk to customers, that they don't talk about channels. They just talk about shopping. Um, and they just talk about shopping from a brand. So going back two or three years, we, um, for, for a large UK retailer, we tried to split out the views of different sub-brands that they operated. And uh, frankly, the customer just did not understand the difference between 
um, the dot com offer, you know, the, the expanded offer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They, they they simply saw that they were shopping and they wanted it to be as convenient and as easy as possible. And they don't talk about channels; they just talk about different ways of getting hold of goods. Thank you very much, Craig. We've just had uh, another question, uh, and they are actually. Uh, coming through uh, fast and thick now, uh, don't uh, we think that uh, luxury groups are good benchmarks uh, on customer experience? Uh, let me uh, just tackle that one initially. Uh, and, and I believe the answer is, is twofold. On the one side, uh, they have been fantastic in a physical environment, creating that retail theatre. Uh, I would argue, though, that uh, historically they have only appealed for a certain segment uh, of the market, which has fundamentally changed today. We are seeing more and more Primani consumers uh, who are happy to shop low one day and to shop high the other day, uh, really, really, and the emerging market consumer distorting that picture of uh, the traditional luxury consumer and I would argue that many luxury brands have not fully embraced that yet and you will also see that many luxury brands still are struggling with taking that customer experience from the physical environment and translating that into the digital environment. Uh, I would argue that many uh, of uh, these brands uh, still lack fundamentally behind uh, a number uh, of the leading lights on the high street today and really have uh, some, some quite considerable catch-up to play. Craig, anything you would like to add? So we see great, ex great customer experiences delivered at, at every level, really. So there are some premium brands in the, um, in the businesses we, we report on, but the absolute key is understanding where to deliver an experience that is it is emotionally re resonant and can be um, related to your brand. So whether you are approaching luxury or the value sector, understanding where those experiences have to be delivered is, is absolutely key to, to getting a return from customer experience transformation. Craig, thank you. Uh, a final question uh, coming through, uh, and as we only have time for one more, uh, this question is, uh, is uh, employing a chief customer officer the key element of becoming a customer-centric organization? What are your thoughts? So from my point of view, um, it's definitely a step in the right direction. But again, if that role is about battling functions and battling silos, it's only one step on a long road. So what we uh, particularly see in the States actually are chief execs who see their role purely as being representatives of the customer. If the chief exec sees himself in that role and drives his day-to-day -day activity in that role, then the organization very rapidly focuses around the needs of the customer and all of those internal siloed and functional um, problems are, are quickly forgotten about as everybody um, gets behind what the chief exec is looking for them to deliver. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed uh, the webcast. David, thank you. Craig, thank you. And a big thank you from myself. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.